Good morning. Uh, maybe you're uh, here this morning and perhaps you wouldn't call yourself a Christian. Maybe you're investigating whether or not Christianity is true. If that's you, then the pressure is off. No one here is expecting you to give any money this morning. For example, in 1994, I was 26 years old and I wasn't giving any money or any gifts to Julia Brown. Why? because I'd never met Julia Brown. In 1994, I did not even know that Julia Brown existed. But when I met her in 1995, she changed my life. And I wanted to give her gifts, money. In fact, I gave her this really nice lime green jacket that you can see in the photograph. But no one compelled me. I fell in love with her, and so I wanted to give and I've given her loads of other gifts since, for example. <laughs> this morning, folks, you will overhear a sermon about giving. But bear in mind that the people in this church I'm speaking to, they actually want to give. Many of them already give money every month. They want to give because they have fallen in love with Jesus. Jesus has done so much for them that they want to give. So this morning, I'll very much be speaking to those who've already decided to follow Jesus. But please listen in, and please tell me at the end what you thought. Okay, here we go. Did you know that Jesus gave investment advice? Jesus was a financial advisor. Here is some free financial advice from Jesus. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moths and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus cares about you. So Jesus points out that if you invest in heaven, you will enjoy life more and you will worry less. Jesus thinks that if you invest in heaven, you will benefit in terms of improved emotional stability. Because nobody's going to break into heaven and steal anyone or anything out of heaven, are they? No, Jesus says, obviously not. If this morning you invest in eternity, that is a great investment. Okay, maybe at this point you're thinking, oh no, is this a church where they preach about money every week? Well, the last time we did a sermon on money was four years ago. So this is not a church where they preach about money every week. But here's the irony of it all. If you or I had been one of Jesus' original 12 disciples, we probably would have heard Jesus preach about money every week. Because according to Jesus' biographers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus spoke about money more than any other topic. Even when teaching on a completely different subject, Jesus regularly used money as a measure to make his point. It would be fair to say that Jesus went out of his way to mention money. It's like Jesus was drawn to the subject. Why? Because what Jesus believed about money and what we think about money are so totally different. Jesus knew that this is the area where you and I need most help. Because I think if I put money into the offering today, if I write with that pen on that envelope, I will have less as a result. If I give money to the church, I will be worse off as a result. Jesus says, no, Adrian, you are totally wrong. You are not losing out. On the contrary, you are making a wise investment. You're investing in eternity. You're investing in heaven. You are storing up treasure in heaven. Here's another example. Let's read the end of the parable of the shrewd manager. Jesus tells a long story, but here is his point. He says, I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves. Really? 
Use world, I told you he thought differently to us. Use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it's gone, what, the friends? No, the money. When the worldly wealth is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings in heaven. Totally different from the way we think. Here's the same verse, same Greek text, but this time a different translation. Luke 16, 9 again. Here's the lesson Jesus says. Use your worldly resources to benefit others and make friends. Then, when your possessions are gone, they, the people you made friends with, the people you invested in, the people you shared the good news with, they will welcome you. Why will they welcome you? Because they're in heaven. They're in heaven because of what happened when you were befriending them. So they're already there. They will welcome you into an eternal home. Wow. Let's try another translation, this time a paraphrase, written by an English vicar who lived in Red Hill, Surrey in the 1950s, wrote a famous paraphrase of the Gospels. Here's the same verse, Luke 16, 9. Now, Jesus says, my advice to you, this is the financial advice, use money, tainted as it is, to make yourselves friends, so that when it comes to an end, they, the friends, may welcome you into eternal habitations. Folks, this gift day is about doing exactly this. It's about investing in eternity. This gift day deliberately comes the Sunday after our Vision Sunday because the two things are inextricably linked. Giving follows vision. It's about investing in those friends, in other people. Jesus says, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail Against it. I want to give to that. I want to give to that vision. So here's the mission statement that we looked at last week. Here is the vision statement that we looked at last week. And so, in seeking to fulfill the mission and the vision that God has given us, we have kids' workers, sound guys at the back, we have welcomers in yellow t shirts, we have youth leaders who all help people know God, find freedom discover their purpose, and make a difference. They help us become a growing church of 500 people, transforming lives and building community. And we also have a building that can also help us towards seeing our mission accomplished and seeing our vision become a reality. Now, how does our building help? Well, for example, it helps us make a difference. We run our debt counseling out of our building. But if we didn't have a building, then people with debt problems would have to rock up at the homes of the debt counselors. Now, that might be okay once you got to know them, because as you can see, they're all very smiley and nice. But think how apprehensive you would be before that first visit, going to that person's house, going to the home of a total stranger. Much better, I'm sure you'd agree, to meet on neutral territory. The other debt counselors are also there. Makes the whole thing a lot safer. This ministry is one of the ways that we fulfill our mission, our building helps. We want teenagers to know God, and we invite them into our building every Tuesday night and every Friday night. We do, admittedly, sometimes wrap them up, as you can see, but they are welcome. The older youth gather on a Tuesday night, all the youth gather on a Friday night. On Fridays, lots of them gather, and they enjoy having the space in our upstairs hall. I know for a fact that lives are being transformed in our building on Friday nights. Our staff can meet and interact and strategize about implementing the vision and our mission in an open plan office in our building. That is a good thing. We held the prayer course in our building. We're going to host the Bible course in our building, as you just heard. Last Sunday, we had a prayer meeting in our building and so on. This building isn't big enough for us all to meet there on Sunday mornings, but I'm sure you get the idea. The downside of having a building is that when things go wrong, they can be really expensive to fix. So right now, we have at least £30,000 worth of repairs needed on our building. Our lift doesn't work at the moment. Well, it actually works sometimes, but that's not very reassuring if you happen to be in it on like the one time... (laughs) You know, it's still rather annoying to be stuck in it. We have spent absolutely ages researching the repair costs, getting multiple quotes. The very cheapest that we can repair it for is £14,000 plus VAT, which is £17,000. Why spend that much 
on a lift. Well, for months now, we've been effectively saying, hey, if you're a teenager and you want to meet Jesus, great, come along any Friday night, half past seven, except if you're disabled. If you're disabled, sorry, we don't cater for you because we meet upstairs. No, we want to invite everyone, able-bodied or not. I'm sure you appreciate that. On Christmas Day, we had a meeting in our building, but we did have people in our church who could not attend because the lift is broken, and actually they can't climb the stairs. Meanwhile, the extractor fan in the upstairs kitchen is broken. It is a complicated system whereby the gas gets cut off so that you can't use the oven. What that means is that at the moment, we can't cook hot food. That will be about 3,000 pounds to get the cooker working. Meanwhile, we cannot control the heating in our building. We do have two brand new boilers that cost us 24,000 pounds, but the control system remains broken, and to repair that will be about 9,000 pounds. You might say, Adrian, why haven't we been told about this until now? The answer to that question is, it's my fault. I genuinely didn't believe that those three things could really total as much as £30,000. So I kept asking for further quotes, further investigations, find out more. Because I didn't want to believe that those repairs would be that expensive. I'm telling you now because I am now convinced that those are real costs and that it can't be done any cheaper. Wait, you say. Why doesn't the church have a building's reserve? I mean, you know you've got a building. You should be keeping some money back for when things go wrong. Well, we have got a building's reserve, but sadly our building is now at an age whereby lots of things that were new when it was first built are now all going wrong at the same time. So like I said, we have just spent £24,000 on new boilers, and we've just had to spend £5,000 on the emergency lights which come on in the event of a fire. That was a legal requirement to have those green lights operational. Yes, we still got some money in our buildings reserve, but we haven't got enough to cover all the repairs. But the big thing I want to say is this. If we can encourage the regular committed monthly giving, then we won't have to ever mention the running repairs on our building. We don't want to be the church that has a thermometer outside that tells everyone how much more we need to repair the steeple. That is not the big thing that we want to communicate. The main goal of this morning is to throw the focus on our regular committed monthly giving because as that increases, we will be able to absorb all the costs of repairs to our building. Adrian, you say, you're supposed to be leading us in this. You say that you want us to focus and increase our regular committed monthly giving. What's your regular committed monthly giving? (laughs) Fair enough. Well, Julia and I give a tenth or a tithe of our income before tax to the Beacon Church. We think the Bible indicates that 10% is the minimum, and so we take it up beyond 10%. We do give to other Christian charities, uh, but we regard that as offerings over and above in addition to the tithe. So that's what we do. You don't have to do that. That's just what we do. In fact, this might, for all I know, be the first time you've ever heard of tithing. No problem. You don't have to do what we do. Maybe you give to the Beacon Church and to three other Christian ministries or charities. And when you add up those four things, that actually does amount to a tenth or a tithe of your income. Again, this could be the first time you've ever heard of the whole tithe going to the local church. That's just what we do. You don't have to do that. Maybe this is the first time that you've heard of tithing before tax, tithing your gross salary, not the net. Again, no problem. You don't have to do what we do. I realize this might all be totally new. So let me therefore share with you an encouraging story, if I may, because whatever you think of what you've heard so far this morning, we can all agree on this. The Bible makes us this promise. And my God will supply all your needs 
according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. Hey, you have a dream for your life. And it might seem rather modest. But there is some preferable future that you are straining towards, that you aspire to. It is no doubt a godly, God-given, God-honoring dream. Can I ask you, what is your dream for your life? What is it that you want to happen in and through your life? My dream was to see thousands of people becoming Christians here in this country. In my dream, I could see myself standing on a stage preaching to people, thousands of people all over, dotted all over this country, all over Britain. At the time, I was part of a church which had 45 people in it. It was a church plant in a town called Rygate in Surrey. Four years later, we'd grown to about 150 people. At that time, I was a commuter. I commuted from Red Hill Station up into central London, up to Victoria. I was working as a sports reporter. I would very occasionally preach on a Sunday to the congregation, which, as I said, was about 150 people, but I was very busy with my job. At this point, the church that I just mentioned, they offered me a full-time job, and it was actually an exciting job. They said, hey, Adrian, how about, rather than being a sports presenter and telling people about football, how about you tell people about Jesus instead? And the job that they offered me was to be a full-time Christian minister. After two years of me not giving this church a reply because I couldn't make up my mind because I was faffing around, yeah, I thought this church deserves a proper answer. So I decided to try and generate a proper answer. I decided that I would pray about it and I decided that I would fast for 40 days while asking God for guidance. At this time, I also asked two Christians who were working in the media for some advice. What do you think I should do? They both said, oh, I think you should stick in sports journalism. But I also wrote to this one particular Christian minister who actually I'd never met and asked him for his advice, and I heard nothing from him until on day 22 of the fast, he rang me. My green phone in my bedroom rang. It was him. It was like really weird. My goodness, like in the letter, yeah. And so I then tell him my whole story about how conflicted I am and how I've been faffing around for two years. And then he's very calm. He says, Adrian, having listened to you, I think, Adrian, what you really want to do is I think you want to work for the church. I think you're just struggling to give up your media career because you think it's a big thing to give up. And when he said those words, because you think it's a big thing to give up, this sort of supernatural peace came upon me. It was physically going down my body. Whoa! That was it. That was God speaking to me. Folks, I was so out of touch with my own feelings that I needed somebody else to tell me what I thought. (laughs) And when he told me what I already thought, whoosh! I mean, I've only had this experience, like I've had it one previous time in my life, this extraordinary supernatural peace. In that moment, the whoosh, the decision was made. I would see out the remaining 18 days of the fast. I would then walk into my boss's office. I'd knock on his door. I'd announce that I was leaving. I'd work out my notice. So day 40 of the fast, I walk up, knock on his office, and I tell him, Keith, I'm leaving. He said, what have they offered you? Because he thought I'd been poached by a rival organization. Um, and I explained, no, 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 Keith, it's not that, it's not that at all. And I'm like, I'm not just leaving, like your, I'm leaving sports journalism, I'm leaving the whole thing. I'm, I'm going to go and work for my church. I'm going to tell people about Jesus. He said, oh, he said, I went to Sunday school. <laughs> so we had an amazing conversation. Anyway, at the end of this conversation, I realized it's now or never, Adrian, this is it. So I went out of the office, I stood on the desk, I gathered the whole department, which was about 30 people. This is quite difficult because we actually were broadcasting on air at the time. I gathered everybody, everybody comes around, and I preached the gospel to them. And in my little sermon, standing on my desk, I kind of brought together the fact that Jesus had been raised from the dead with the fact that I was leaving, as if those were two inextricably linked (laughs) things. 
And they are actually different things. It's like I kind of conflated them in my brief, unrehearsed sermon. And then having got that, they all applauded. I thought, well, that's good. Well, presumably that's good. They all applauded. And I thought, right, so again, now or never, I thought I'm going to send an email. So I, I, pre- I, I type the most Jesus-tastic email that I've ever written to everyone in the organization. Press send before I have a chance to think about it again. So sharing the gospel to everybody in our organization by email. And then on the very final day, so it's 21 days later, on the final day of my time as a sports journalist, I had this bizarre exit interview with the head of human resources. And this lady, her job is to find out more about why people leave the organization. So I go, I'm, I'm ready for this. I think, this is a great opportunity. She's going to sit there. I'm going to tell her the story. She's going to be, what, 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 what? She's being paid to listen to the gospel. This is amazing. So I go in there, and I share the gospel with her, and she smiles all the way through. And then I finish, and she looks at me, and she says, Adrian, you and I have got a lot in common. I said, yes. And she pointed to a picture on her desk of the actor Richard Gere. She said, because Adrian, I'm a Buddhist as well. (laughs) And I thought, oh, well, I I obviously didn't explain my reasons as clearly as I thought. (laughs) So I don't come out of that very well, I'm sure you'd agree. Anyway, three days after that conversation, I was working for the church in Surrey. So I went down to 40% of what I had been earning. Question, could I live on less than half of what I had been earning? Answer, there is only one way to find out. Well, guess what? Having taken a 60% pay cut, I didn't starve to death. I found that Philippians 4.19 is true. And incidentally, since I stopped telling people about football and started telling people about Jesus, I did see thousands of people in this country become Christians all over the place. I spent 25 years seeing hundreds of people turn to Christ every year. My dream to see thousands of people meet Jesus in Britain came true. But I had to trust God to provide all of my needs. If I hadn't taken that step, I wouldn't be here. You and I would never have met. At the time, I was wondering, could I carry on tithing and take a 60% pay cut? I decided there is only one way to find out. God provided all my needs. Okay, you say, enough already. What are you on about? What what is the origin of this term you've mentioned, tithe or tithing? Well, it's something that the Israelites did in the Old Testament. There was tithing before the law was introduced through Moses because Abraham tithed and Jacob tithed. But I don't think that makes it prescriptive for us today. However, let's look at Genesis 28, 22. Jacob has just encountered God at a place called Bethel. And Jacob says to God, of all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. Everything I have comes from you. It's all yours, really, in the first place, God. On that basis, you could say that my money is not really my money. God is the creator. God made the universe out of nothing. God made our planet. God made all the natural resources. My money? Who am I kidding? God made the oxygen that's keeping me alive. God gives me all ten tenths, everything I have. Then symbolically, he asked me to give him one tenth back, one tenth being a tithe. In the book of Malachi, God says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. Now, if you think that tithing is Old Testament law, which is no longer binding or valid, fine. But it would be odd if now we've got Jesus, we gave less. The principle was that they gave a tenth, If they gave a tenth under the law, and we've got Jesus, we've got eternal forgiveness of sins, we've got the guarantee of heaven, it would be strange if we gave less. Strange if grace 
gave less than law. Throughout the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus acknowledged the Old Testament standard and then raised it. I think it would be odd if Jesus lowered the bar on giving, especially without telling us. Because Jesus did uphold the tithe, according to Matthew 23, verse 1, when speaking to the crowds and to his disciples. Now, we don't have time for a full teaching on such a controversial subject, and there are lots of different views. So please, just regard this as just one person's view, one person's report of one person's journey. Because my question was, can I take a 60% pay cut and carry on tithing? And God said, test me in this. Test me in this and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. Now, seeing as it says elsewhere in the Bible, thou shalt not put the Lord thy God to the test, I was really interested in any verse that encourages me to test God. Well, this verse did, and I I found him to be trustworthy. Hey, if you knew, if I knew for a fact that everything would work out, that financially it would all be fine, then you and I would give money, we'd give money this morning, and we wouldn't worry about it. If God showed you a video of your future, a video of your life five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, you could see that everything worked out fine. You'd say, oh, it's all right then. You give, I give, we wouldn't worry about it. It's fine. I've seen the video, it's fine, it all works out. 20 years down the track, you give, I give. More than happy to give, what's for dinner? Next thing, move on. You say, look, um, Adrian, I'll be honest with you. I'm struggling a bit with the talk this morning because it seems, Adrian, I don't know, Adrian, maybe you don't watch the news. Um, Apparently, um, that there is this massive economic crisis that you seem to be unaware of. Um, Energy bills have doubled, tripled, quadrupled. Things are actually going to get worse. Maybe you're not aware of that. that. We've got the Ukraine war. That's still continuing. Yes. Yes. Let's just put tithing to one side for now. I cannot get beyond Philippians 4.19. Paul guaranteed the Philippians, my God will supply all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. Now, not all your wants, not all my wants. doesn't say that. Your needs and my needs will be met. If you honor God, he will honor you. So the main goal of today, the reason why we have put these envelopes on every chair is for us to review our regular committed monthly giving. Please don't be distracted by the subject of tithing. Start where you're at. If you decided in 2018 to give £20 a month to the Beacon Church, has your income increased since 2018? Last week, we heard the local church is the hope of the world. Please pray about investing more into your future, into Christ's bride, the church. Maybe you feel now you should give £25 a month. If everything else has gone up, maybe your investment into the bride of Christ should go up. Maybe you never decided on a figure. You decided on a percentage. If you decided five years ago to give 5% of your income to the Beacon Church, are you still giving 5%? Maybe your income has increased and the truth is that now you're giving 4%. I'd strongly encourage you to pray about honoring that commitment you made to give 5%. Keep investing in Christ's bride, the church. Maybe you can bring it up to 6%. 10%? Look, if you've never even heard of tithing to the local church, if you've never done it, that would be a huge decision to get there in a single bound. But whatever you give, however much, however little, at the second coming of Christ, you will not regret investing in Christ's bride. Because it's the church that goes on until the return of Christ. It's the church that goes on through. Beyond that, Jesus marries his bride, the church. We can actually see the wedding celebration in Revelation chapter 19. We can see the actual wedding of Christ in Revelation chapter 21. I would say that the most exciting part of the adventure of being a Christian for me and my wife Julia has been trusting God with money. We have seen the floodgates of heaven open and God has poured out so much blessing that there has not been room enough for us to store it. 
Let me tell you a funny story about that. In 2003, when Julia and I were living in Birmingham, uh, at that time we had two children, and we were asked by New Frontiers, the family of churches that we're a part of, uh, to move to central London and to help start a new church. But how could we ever afford to live in central London? Julia and I were living in Birmingham. We had two children. We worked out for the price that we could sell our house in Birmingham for, we worked out that we could afford a two-bed flat in central London. But we wanted to have two more children. We wanted to have four children. So we would live in a two-bed flat, me and Julia in one bedroom, all four kids in the other bedroom. So anyway, during half-term, Julia goes down to London to look for two-bed flats. And she rings me, and she says, oh, she says, I found this great house. Well, I was immediately concerned by the use of the word house. <laughs> I thought, well, maybe my wife doesn't really understand money. You know, maybe she doesn't really get the fact. You can't just buy a house that you can't afford. She said, oh, she says, it's got this massive kitchen. We'll be able to have loads of people over. She said, it's ideal for church planting, she says. <laughs> and then she says, I believe that God is going to give us this house. Now, just to explain, over the years, there have been several occasions when my wife has said something dramatic <laughs> like that. And every single time that she's made one of these dramatic statements, pronouncements, it has always turned out to be right. So I asked, okay, okay, just one question. How much is this house on the, money, on the market for? And when she told me the price, I nearly fell off my chair. But we did find a mortgage lender who agreed to lend us this enormous loan. So we sold our house in Birmingham, and the move was all going through nicely. And Julia actually found a school for our kids in London, but the term started straight away. Our kids had to start school immediately, but we lived in Birmingham. So we can't start school in London straight away. It's going to be another six weeks until we can move. So I decided, OK, no problem. Julia and our two girls will move down to London. They'll live with my parents. So at least the girls can start school. We're not going to lose the school places. I will stay in Birmingham and mind the shop. I'll live there uh, on my own for six weeks until the move goes through. I think to myself, we don't really want to split the family up, but it's only for six weeks because we know this deal is going to go through. Everything is great. We've got the mortgage lender on side. We've already heard they're going to lend us the money. So Julia and the girls move to London. I'm living on my own in Birmingham. Everything's boxed up in boxes. Three weeks later, the mortgage lender phones up and says, oh, Mr. Holloway, you know how we said we'd advance you that enormous loan? I said, yes, I do remember you saying that. He said, well, yeah, we've changed our minds, Mr. Holloway. You're too big a risk. I said, no kidding. He said, yeah, no kidding. So that was the end of that. So now, folks, at this point, there was only one lender in Britain who would ever even be in the market to advance us the loan because the multiples we needed were so large. So as you know, normally, a mortgage lender might lend you four or four and a half times your salary. For us to buy this house in central London, we needed a loan that was 13 times our income. <laughs> There was an audible gasp there. Uh, anyway, we asked for this loan. Mr. Holloway, they reply, we would consider your application if your wife was going to go to work full time. But seeing as you keep saying she's only going to be working part time, I'm afraid this is the only lender that can make it happen. The answer is no. You see, we decided on the point of principle that Judy wasn't going to go back to work full time at this stage. So at that point, we were completely and utterly stuck. We have actually sold our house in Birmingham. The only mortgage lender in Britain that could possibly make this move happen, they've said no. But then I remember that my wife has said that God <laughs> is going to give us this house. So my only hope and prayer was that I'd phone this mortgage lender back and I'd say, this is my strategy, hey, how about changing your mind? <laughs> That's my strategy. 
So I ring them back and I say, hey, yeah, me, me again, Mr. Holloway. Yeah, we were, yeah, that's right. We were speaking just a few minutes ago. So, yeah, when we spoke a few minutes ago and I asked you for a mortgage, do you remember how you said no? Yeah, you remember that? Yeah. How about, instead of saying no, how about you say yes? <laughs> and she said, uh, well, she said, um, I can always ask. And she put me on hold. And I will never forget the hold music. It's going, da, 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 da. And as I'm listening to the hold music, I kind of realize this is the decisive moment. When she takes me off hold, whatever she says is going to be the defining moment of this whole thing. And so I think I need to pray. So I start praying, but I don't actually pray in English. I start praying in a different language, I start using a, 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 a prayer language, the, the, a prayer in, in, in tongues, in a different language. So the whole music's going... And I go... And and after listening to my uninterpreted tongues for a short while, this lady takes me off hold. And she says, Mr. Holloway, she says, you're never going to believe this. I said, yeah, but we've changed our minds. You can have a mortgage. Yeah, I thought that was pretty good. But she said, there is one condition. I said, oh, really? She said, um, yeah, we'll only give you the money after your wife has started work in her new permanent part-time job. I said, yeah, but the thing is, as I was trying to explain earlier, she doesn't actually have uh, like, like a job I I in the area because we're actually due to move in, in a few days from now. So how, I asked the mortgage broker, how is she going to find a new job and start work that quickly, the broker said, oh, well, I've absolutely no idea. So I ring Julia, and I say, I've got good news and bad news. She said, oh, what's the good news? I said, we've got a mortgage. She said, that's fantastic. She says, how can there possibly be any bad news? I said, the bad news is you've got to find and start a permanent part-time job in the next 24 hours. <laughs> you've got to start working there immediately. She said, well, how am I going to manage that? I said, I have no idea. Anyway, I then go into this all-day meeting, which I remember was in Beaconsfield. And when I come out of this meeting, it was about 3.30. The phone rings, and it's her. I pick up, and she says, special one. <laughs> but that's what she calls me. <laughs> for, for obvious reasons. <laughs> special one, she says, I've got a job. I said, well, how do you manage that? She said, well... I've rung up the school where I used to work in Oxted, in Surrey. I've got straight through to the head of science. And he says to me, I thought you live in Birmingham, yeah? She says, no, no, I, well, I'm trying to move to London. And the thing is, I, I want to try and reach people. We're going to start a new church. We're going to try and reach people with the good news about Jesus by starting a new church. But in order to actually move to London, we need a mortgage. And to get a mortgage, I need a job. And the head of science says, oh, you're never going to believe this, Julia. The reason why I'm in the staff room, the reason why I'm not teaching, I've left the kids all on their own, unsupervised. I'm in the staff room because somebody's just left and I need, I'm staring at the phone thinking I need someone that I know and trust who can start work immediately. Do you want your job back? Please say yes. Julia says, yes. <laughs> and she started work there straight away. We got the mortgage the deal went through, we moved bang on schedule, and here's the kicker, here's the kicker. After the deal's completed, after we've gone through, we've got this massive mortgage, three people in the next week invested huge sums of money into our property, that brought down the size of the monthly interest payments to a manageable level. The Apostle Paul told the Philippians what he says to you and me, what God says to you and me, my God will supply all of your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. Maybe the band would like to come and join me. You know, we did start that church that I told you about, the church plant. And in the first five years of that church, we saw 197 people become Christians. And we baptized 165 people. God can make dreams come true. What's your dream? 
We're talking about transforming lives here in Camberley and Farnborough and Sandhurst and Yateley and so on. We're talking about building community here. We're talking about you helping people find freedom, know God, discover their purpose, and make a difference. We're talking about you investing in the body of Christ, in the bride of Christ, in the hope of the world. That's not an exaggeration, by the way. The local church is the hope of the world. Politicians are not going to do it. Economists are not going to do it. This is it. This is the plan. This is God's plan A, the local church. There is no plan B. Jesus has staked everything on the local church. That's where it's at. Jesus has said, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Do you want to invest in something that will last forever? Do you want to invest in eternal souls? Do you want to write yourself into God's story? You can. And as you give, don't worry. God has promised he will supply all of your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus.